Hello and welcome to this Cambridge Festival online event. My name is Suzanne Turner and I'm curator here at the Museum of Classical Archaeology. Unfortunately, we can't welcome you here for a tour in our cast gallery. So instead, I'm going to be leading you on a tour from home in three short parts. In this first part, I will be exploring with you some Roman sculptures, the statue of the Farnese Hercules, and also some Roman imperial portraits. And we are one of nine university museums and collections that together form the University of Cambridge Museums. Yep, yeah, it just it rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, and we are the littlest of those collections. In many ways, too, we are a slightly strange collection. Um, because what you're looking at here are plaster casts, replicas, copies of statues from the ancient world, Greece and Rome. Um, and that makes us freaky weird, really, because basically I'm sort of telling you that I've got a collection of fakes here, aren't I? Except they're not, they're not fakes. At no point in their history have any of the objects in this gallery kind of tried to be passed off as their original. No one has ever pretended that they're anything other than a replica. Um, but it does make us a very different collection to other collections within the university. Or indeed, uh, museum collections more generally. If you think about how a museum collection is typically grown, um, it's through serendipity. And look, what was discovered at what point in time, what um, came on the market at what point in time, what was donated, and through lots of other processes. And instead, our objects, in many cases, were chosen from the pages of the catalogue by my predecessors. Our collection was built up very strategically and deliberately. So what I want to do today is think a little bit more about what it means for us to have a collection of copies. Um, and that means not only thinking about the casts, but also about the originals that they represent. Because copying and processes of replication are not restricted to the 18th and 19th centuries, or indeed um, the collection today. The, in the ancient world, copy and culture was a really important part of the Roman world. And our castes have a foot in both the ancient and modern worlds. So they're kind of hybrid objects. So I want to think a little bit today about those multiple histories of replication and how they've shaped the objects that we have. What I'm standing next to here is our plaster cast of the Farnese Hercules. Um, I don't know how much of him you can see because he is actually massive. We can't quite fit both of us in, in the screen at the same time. Uh, and he's huge. Um, he's one of the earliest casts in our collection. So our collection began in the Fitzwilliam Museum in the year that it opened, in the year 1848-49, that academic year, when the Fitzwilliam Museum was gifted three plaster casts. And the next year, they were gifted a collection of 30 plaster casts, all of which came from the same house that originally stood on the banks of the Thames. And the Farnese Hercules was one of those casts. So it came from a collection of copies. Now, I don't know about you guys watching this, but he wouldn't fit in my entrance hallway. Um, so it was a very big house. And in fact, he had an entire sculpture gallery. All of the cars were displayed together in a sculpture gallery. Um, and the house no longer exists, and it's difficult for us to reconstruct it. But in, in essence, these replicas um, all stood in this house, and the great and the good of the 19th century art world came to visit them. And they functioned as kind of, I guess, embodiments of the cultural capital that the classical world represented in the 18th and 19th centuries. They were more than just kind of decorative features in this house. Um, but a plaster cast is, in fact, a very different type of copy than the original Farnese Hercules was, because he too was a copy. The original stood in the bars of Caracal in Rome. Um, and it was huge because the plaster cast is the same size uh, and probably it was on quite a tall base so not down low like this and it was a replica of an earlier sculpture of Hercules that had been made sort of maybe 300 or so 400 or so years before 
So the Romans too were engaged in making copies, but they made them very differently. They had the technology to make plaster casts. We know because we found bits of plaster cast, but we found them in sculptural workshops rather than in people's houses. So it looks as if plaster casts were used as a means of disseminating um, kind of well-loved originals around sculpture workshops around the ancient world where they could then be turned into multiple versions by the sculptors. The sculptors were doing that by using calipers to measure, so they weren't making exact copies. And in fact, the Farnese Hercules is a really nice example of that, because the original, which is now lost, we're never ever going to find it again, um, was probably not quite this big. And one of the things that Roman sculpture buyers liked to do when they invested in these kind of free copies was they liked to kind of inject a little bit of play. So we find out absolutely huge Hercules like this one. And then we find little, little bitty ones that kind of are like sort of garden gnomes or tabletop decorations. And of course that plays out really nicely for a figure who is kind of um, like the hero par excellence and is all about his body, really. So uh, Roman copying was very flexible. Now the traditional way of understanding these processes of copying particularly since we don't have the originals, is that maybe sometimes they're just a little bit subpar. And maybe that's because the Romans didn't quite know um, what, they were, what they were buying, essentially. Maybe they were sort of bad connoisseurs. And that's very much been a traditional way of sort of understanding and interpreting classical art history in terms of a kind of rise and fall narrative of kind of improvement, 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 archaic to classical, all Hellenistic starts to go down, Roman's all bad, really bad. Um, but more recently people have tried to reassess Roman copying and this kind of copying culture, these free copies that we see in the ancient world, and try to think of them a little bit more in terms of how every act of copying is a kind of process of the creation of meaning. And I hope you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit invested in this interpretation given that I curate an entire gallery of copies. <laughs> feel it, I really feel it. Uh, so if you think about it, every time a copy is made it's always different to its original. It might be that the material changes, so very often the rumours would switch from um, a bronze original to a marble copy or a different material change. In fact copying very often actually is a transfer of materiality. Um, but also that, that play with size is also one way of introducing change and changing the way that we engage with the sculpture and the types of meanings that it might carry. And of course, little tiny tweaks in either the style or the pose, all of these can actually have very big impacts on the way that we understand a copy or the way that we engage with it. And then there's the bigger sort of picture of context of display. So the fun easy Hercules here, we probably engage with him quite differently than we might if he was still in the Fitz Museum. But simultaneously, we engage with him very differently than we would if we were viewing him in his beautiful sculpture gallery on the Thames. Um, but also, we probably engage, Roman audiences would have engaged with one of their free copies very differently if they viewed it in, say, a house rather than a garden. So each of these kind of processes of, de of decision making, some of which are done by the patron, the owner, some of which are done by the sculptor, introduce um, new meanings into the sculpture. So that every single replica, although it's linked to its, its original by a kind of invisible, indelible line, you can't really have a copy if you don't recognise it as a copy. Sense, does it lose its meaning and value? At the same time, it is an independent object with its own history and its own biography and its own viewers and its own sort of meaning, as it were. Does that make sense? So I think that's enough about the Fine Easy Hercules. And now what we're going to do is go and look at the ways in which copying plays out in some of the rest of our objects from the ancient world. We're here now in the Roman portraits. I want to talk about the portraits in terms of how they function as copies. 
So I don't know how much you know about how portraits were made in the Roman world, how the emperor sort of had control of his image. We're very used to thinking about the production of the imperial image in terms of propaganda, which would mean that the images were made in the centre and then disseminated throughout the empire. But in fact, actually, that would be a much more top-down model than we see. Instead, we understand portrait dissemination through a process of a much more kind of bottom-up process. So Augustus would have had his portrait carved, um, and presumably he had the okay of whether it was the one that he wanted because it was going to be his official portrait. But he didn't then have lots of portraits made up of himself and then send them out. Instead, that official portrait type was probably sent out to sculptural workshops again, which would have been based throughout the empire. And individual towns or cities might make the decision to erect a statue of Augustus, probably, you know, thinking to themselves, oh, you know what, our, what would really make our agora? Oh, portrait of the emperor. That's, that's, an, that's an excellent idea, that. Um, and, you know, maybe might please the emperor too at the same time. So yay, good times. But what that means is that portraits were being made in lots of different styles because each sculptural workshop, the sculptors there probably would have been trained in local techniques and styles. And that can make identifying portraits a little bit tricky. Um, so what you see here are a series of portraits of Augustus and probably on face value they do look really similar. So if we look at the facial features, you know this one is an Augustus, that one's an Augustus, we've got an Augustus there, he's an Augustus, another one behind me as well. Um, and we probably do look at these and feel quite confident that we could tell just from looking at the faces that they're all the same chap. Although I'm standing here and thinking, actually, I can see that this guy's got a slightly different nose. And he also has slightly, um, in some ways, more lines, but in some ways, this guy's got a more furrowed brow. And this guy's definitely not got a furrowed brow. And this guy's pretty perfect looking. No wrinkles. He's wrinkle free. He's been using his face cream and SPF every day. Um, but in fact, because of all of these kind of regional variations, sometimes relying on the facial features isn't actually the most reliable way and it's not what scholars always use to identify portraits. In fact, scholars use a technique called counting locks and it does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, there are people out there who have stayed their entire careers on this. So um, what you need to do to identify your portrait of Augustus, you're looking for particular locks of hair. And if we were doing it properly, we'd be looking all over the head, but we can get away with just doing the ones at the front. So what you're looking for is one lock that curls around like this in the middle of the forehead, and then two or three that curl back towards it. So you can see he's got them. This guy here's got them too. This chap's got them as well. He's a nice example of it. And, I mean, it sounds like absolute madness, doesn't it? I'm genuinely telling you that scholars don't bother looking at facial features to identify a portrait. They look at the hair. What craziness is this? But there is logic behind it. So remember I said all those regional sculptors working in their individual styles? What that can mean is that actually you can get quite different facial features. So this guy's been applying all of his SPF and he looks terribly smooth. Um, and wrinkle free, whereas this guy's got a really deep furrow on his brow. And this guy has a bit of a bump on the end of his nose, etc, etc. This guy's got an even slimmer nose. The way that the thinking goes is that actually sculpting hair is pretty hard. It's really difficult because hair is kind of wild, as Disney has taught us, for instance, um, when they did Tangled and they had to come up with a whole algorithm just to do the hair and make it move naturally. That's an aside. Um, <laughs> but hair, that means that that also means that probably where a sculptor is working on replicating uh, the prototype for the portrait, they're much more likely to stay true to the layout of the locks, which gives some kind of order um, to the hair, than they are perhaps to replicate the style of the prototype. So, for instance, this guy's got a lovely bushy head of hair 
um, lots of mousse or volumizer in that one. And this chap's hair is much flatter. That's quite different. This guy's got a kind of little quiff, but the other, other locks across the head are a little bit less defined. And his hair is really neat and tidy. But the locks are the same. Now that, and what that means is that scholars then are able to build up what's called a corpus of portraits. So different scholars might argue over what belongs in the corpus, but the body, the central body, usually stays the same. So they'll argue over ones on the edges of one person will say, yes, I think that is an Augustus. Another person will say, oh, it's probably not an Augustus. I don't agree. Uh, but but the, the process of counting locks, I suppose, gives a kind of strategy, something to hold on to, to identify the portrait types. Now, it's clearly not a flawless plan, because if, for instance, I were to get my hair cut like Victoria Beckham, it is enormously unlikely that you, viewing me now, would think, oh my gosh, it's Victoria Beckham. And you see, that's the thing about hairstyles. Other people can have them too. And just like celebrities today, the emperor and the empress would set sort of the fashions for everyone to follow. So we might find that people wanting to kind of aspire upwards would adopt a hairstyle used by the emperor. But we also find that, for instance, Augustus himself uses his hairstyle in pretty clever ways. So this portrait up here doesn't look like the other portraits of Augustus. But if we look closely at the hair, we'll see those same locks of hair. It would be difficult to believe that this is Augustus representing himself as ruler because he wasn't a child when he became emperor. So either we've got a really young portrait of Augustus here as Octavian, or more likely what we're seeing is the kind of visual construction of a dynasty. So Augustus Basically, he was really unlucky. He kept adopting lots of heirs, and unfortunately, they kept dying on him when they were very young. And so this particular portrait has been um, identified as his grandson, one of those heirs, who met a sad and untimely end before he could see through um, his heirdom, as it were. But by, by giving him the same hairstyle, what that does is plug this portrait into Augustus's imagery. So it creates this visual link that viewers can see to understand that there's a bloodline or a family line there, whether it's a constructed one because Augustus could also adopt heirs that he wasn't related to, or whether it is one by blood. So we see actually a very dynamic use of these hairstyles as well. But at their root, these hairstyles are functioning this way, ultimately, because making portraits is a process of replication and then variation. So whether it's replication of the prototype or whether it's other people copying the hairstyle or um, Augustus and the imperial family finding mileage in continuing to use that hairstyle to create dynastic imagery, it's, it's this kind of process of sculptural copying that sits at the root of it. Thank you for joining us in this online tour. We hope that you will come and visit us when we're able to open our doors again.